Welcome back to another Mac Deck Tech. Today we're going over the upgrade guide for Virtue and Valor from Wilds of Eldraine. This deck focuses heavily on enchantments and the new role mechanic introduced in this set. For those unaware of the roles, they are token enchantment auras. Each creature can only have one per player attached to them. If another role would be attached by the same player, the first one falls off. Before we dive on in, I noticed that most of you still aren't subscribed to the channel. Go ahead and do me a favor. Tap that subscribe button to ensure that you never miss an episode. This episode is actually dedicated to Stacy Peoples. Stacy, you rock. As with all of our upgrade guides, we're doing the center 10 cards out, 10 cards in, but unlike many of our upgrade guides, I'm swapping the commander. Elevator of Wild Court offers up some power with the Virtuous Roll. However, Gawain, Casting Director, offers up that variety, that spice of life, and they're going to offer it up more than once a turn, potentially, based on the number of creatures that are entering the battlefield. So let's take a look at what just didn't make the cut. Starting off, we have Careful Cultivation. It's an interesting aura that acts as ramp, um, and a small power boost for the creature that it gets attached to. But it's 3 mana, it takes 2 turns to pay for itself, making it a tad slower than we prefer our ramp to kind of be. So for that reason, Careful Cultivation is out. Following that up, we have Fertile Ground, which also takes 2 turns to pay for itself, while ramping is always good. We have some powerful ramps still in the deck once these 2 pieces are taken out. And I don't think we're going to really, you know, feel that impact at all. <laughs> Junkai Naturalist is up next, and at this point it really seems like I'm dead set on paying top mana for all my spells. But rest assured, I know what I'm doing. We have a number of cost reducing cards already in the deck that aren't on these, like, little flimsy bodies. So I think we're going to be alright. Liberated Livestock follows up the Naturalist and is a 4-6 for 6 that six, so is looking to die. We don't really have Sack Outlets built in the deck. You know, this thing can chump for days, you know, but those ch that chump's not going to kill it, you know. I just, I think we have better things to do than pay six mana for a thing that's going to hit the board, kind of just be a chumper, and is looking to die to get the value we're looking for in this deck. Bonecrafter Fawn lets us trade off lands for non-lands in our Grave Upon ETB. And while this deck sports 39 lands out of the box, the trigger is only going to happen once, and we both need to have lands in hand that we don't need, and non-lands in the grave that we want back. Early game, this card is trash. You know, we're not really looking to get rid of all of our lands in hand. We want to be able to play them, you know, get up to the point where we have a good solid mana base to be playing our spells. Mid-game, it gets a little better. And it could really shine in the end, especially if, like, someone board wipes and we're able to, you know, discard a handful of lands that we don't want to get back some things that are going to, you know, really give us, give us the ability to rebuild after those kind of board wipes. But being dead in the early game just kind of makes it not worth my while. So, Lone Crafter Fawn, you're out of here. Ox Drover feels super out of place in this deck. I mean, I guess the, like, the card draw is decent. The fact that the token we hand away can't block our 4-4 four four is cool. But, like, right? Am I the only one questioning what Ox Drover is doing in here? Because it doesn't make sense. Please make it make sense to me. Pollen Bright Wings, uh, just a little too costly for what it does if we were running more into like a token manners kind of strategy. I could see it sticking around. You know, some of our honorable mentions, which we'll get to at the end of the deck tech, could kind of make it worth keeping. But as is now, as like I've built the deck, you know, it's just not worth sticking around. Spectral Steel follows that up, and 2-2 two, two for 2 is decent, the ability to exile it from the grave to grab a different aura back to hand. Kind of decent, but a little slow, right? We're not doing a whole lot of, like, discarding, so it definitely needs to hit the field, be on a body, that body needs to die, or someone needs to target it as removal. And if you're going to remove an enchantment in this stack, it's certainly not the one that, one, is going to let us cheat back an enchantment from our grave, and two, 
isn't going to be the one that's only putting out plus two, plus two. You know what I mean? There are much stronger targets. So, Spectral Steel, get out of here. Transcendent Envoy is another aura cost reducer that I think we're going to be fine without. We still have some cost reduction in the deck and some powerful mana orcs that will give us all that we need to cast our big spells on or ahead of curve. Last card to be cut is Verdant Embrace. Uh, same reason as pulling Bright Wings. You know, paying 5 mana for plus 3 plus 3 and an extra token on each turn is kind of useful. If we were leaning really heavily into the token matters sort of synergy that we could, they definitely get to stay. But as it's not our major focus, I feel like we have better things to do than use Burden and Embrace. Hope it's going to swoop in here and take their place. Katilda Donhart Martyr is at the top of our list as a powerful creature whose power is going to consistently be just super high in this stack. Thanks to all those rolls that we're passing out like candy. As an added benefit, we could always disturb her from the grave, bringing her back as a uh, nice little enchantment for one of our, you know, one of our other creatures. And now they get this big boost. So this kind of like two for one special that we're seeing here is a chef's kiss moment. You know, super powerful out the gate powerful on second play and like we're gonna we're gonna see some see some damage come from this thing especially with that flying lifelink i'm all about it moving away from creatures and into some spells that we could sling we have brilliant restoration to cheat back all of our enchantments from the grave to the field which includes a number of our creatures don't let the fact that our commander is passing out you know token enchantments throw you off this deck still packs a ton of actual physical enchantments, uh, sitting at 21 non-creature enchantments and another 4 enchantment creatures. I do look Tutor is up next, definitely a little more budget friendly than Enlightened Tutor as an addition to the deck. Being able to search up a powerful enchantment that might let you end the game is going to be powerful even if it's a little slower in terms of speed and costing a few more pips of mana. Research and Belief is another way to recover from a board wipe. It's a little slow needing to be suspended first, but full board recovery like this is hard to come by, and so I think that the suspend timing, you know, still pretty good, and you could also use it as a kind of bluff, right? Or not a bluff, but a stall. You know an opponent wants to board wipe. You slap this bad boy out into suspend, and they're like, <sighs> Now I want to wait for Research and Belief to finish, like, triggering before I actually wipe this board. Otherwise, they're just going to get all this stuff back, and I'm going to be left, you know, pants down, wide open the field. So, I think Research and Belief is some pretty good tech here. Alongside that recovery, I think we could use some cost reduction that isn't on a creature, which I feel is the easiest thing to remove. And we have that in the form of Cloud Key, which is also nice and flexible. Although we're almost always going to choose enchantments, we could technically choose creatures if we wanted to. We could choose them for sorceries. We don't have a ton of those. But, you know, creatures or enchantments are going to be our bread and butter here. They comprise most of the deck. And reducing either of them is definitely going to pay dividends. We can offer up our enchantments and protection in the form of Shroud with Greater Oromancy, making them difficult for our opponents to remove, basically requiring them to either remove Greater Oromancy first or have a board wipe that affects enchantments, which most don't. Hallowed Haunting follows up our Oromancy and is going to offer Flying and Vigilance to our board pretty easily and offer up some powerful token creatures who can pack the kind of punch we need to end the game. I think this is probably our most expensive edition, sitting around $14, but its ability to end the game makes it worth it to me. Primal Vigor is up next, and I know what you're thinking. We aren't leaning too heavily into the tokens, so what's happening here? Well, I'll tell you. It's a nice budget way to double up all the token generation that we do have, which includes the rolls which are freely given out by our commander. So what I hear you cry out. No creature could have more than one roll from us. True, I retort. But we have a number of effects that only care about the enchantments ET being, and this is going to let us double up on those, often giving us a lot of card draw. 
Sphere of Safety is here to let us pillow fort and avoid the crack back that we likely deserve based on our board state. Uh, you know, is our opponent going to be willing to pay, you know, 5 plus mana to attack per creature? I don't think they will. They want to be able to cast their own spells and deal damage elsewhere through combat for free. Before committing all those resources to, like, cracking open our gate to try and get in some chip damage. Last up we have Sterling Grove, which offers our enchantments protection in the form of Shroud. Using it with Greater Oromancy protects both of them from being targeted, meaning the only option our opponents have is a board wipe. A lot like the Fade deck we went over last week, we really don't have any major combos in this deck either. We do, however, have a new section, Honorable Mentions, which includes cards that cost a bit too much to pick up while keeping the deck kind of budget friendly. But if you already have these cards, or you could just afford to pick them up, I'm going to highly recommend doing so. Anointed Procession will start us off and kind of set the tone for the direction we're leaning with these cards that could have been. Uh, we're going to double up all of our rolls that we're generating, which is going to let us reap the benefits of all the enchantments that are ETBing, drawing us a ton of cards, and it doubles it. So there are certain things that, you know, it's not just plus one. Right for a commander, 100% plus one. For some other things, you know, especially if we brought back Pollen Bright Wings or something, it really just, you see a huge boom in it. Anointed Procession is fantastic. It's in my fiance's Boros token deck, and it packs a punch. Speaking of packing a punch, doubling season is in here as well for the exact same reason. Although it also happens to work wonders with Starfield Mystic, um, since he's also going to gain counters for those token enchantments going to the grave. This is going to double up both the generation of the rolls in the first place, but also double up the tokens that he's getting when they pop. Enlightened Tutor is here. It is the card that we tell Ideal Tutor not to worry about. Same effect, better speed, better cost. Just all around better. Mondrak is here for a more token doubling, as is Parallel Lives. So, right, we're really heavily leaning into the idea that now the tokens do matter. These token doublers definitely cost, you know, a pretty penny to pick up, which is why that's not the direction we went with the deck. But I feel like either direction works. Uh, you know, it's really just up to you, matter of preference. And matter of budget. But hey, you know, we're in white, so obviously we have both Smothering Tithe and Teferi's Protection. But guys, that's the deck. Let me know what you think. Uh, we're going to have another custom deck tack out next week for Nate. Uh, he asked for Adelis the Cinder Wind, so make sure you tune in for that one. That being said, were there cards that I took out of the deck that you feel like, hey, those should have stayed? Were there cards that I added in that you're kind of questioning what they're doing there? Is there a commander that you'd like to see a build around? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, good luck with your builds.